The 27th Conference of Parties or COP27 concluded in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt over the weekend. Now, COPs have entered our imagination far more than in the past, especially with COP26 in Glasgow last year. This year was no different. You know, a lot of reporting, technical terms such as loss and damage, 1.5 degrees, 2.5 degrees, mitigation, adaptation, all being thrown around, confusing a lot of people sometimes who want to follow this issue. But at the heart of this issue is something very dire. The fact that human civilization as we know it could be under threat in a few decades because of how as a civilization we are organized. So we'll be talking about why COP27, what happened at COP27, why it was important and what does it bode for the future in this episode of Mapping Fortlands. We are joined by Prabir Burkaista. Prabir, so uh, like I said, the, the reporting has been, there's been a barrage of reporting, uh, you know, a lot of terms. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the you know 1.5 degrees, 2.5 degrees, loss and damage, adaptation, mitigation, you know, all these questions. But these are not just about terms because as a lot of the reports have also pointed out, we are seeing the impact of climate change today. Right now, people are being affected across the globe in terms of food, in terms of water, in terms of basic survival, uh, you know, the, in terms of homes, for instance. So could you maybe first take us through what are the quick impressions you got out of this year's uh, COP27, COP conference or COP27? I, I think let's put the COP27 a little in the back burner in our discussions because you raise a larger question, what's happening to the globe? And if you take that into account, well, that's the background which COP27 had to address. We already have 1.1 degrees rise of temperature and we are talking about 1.5 degrees being the threshold. And if you blow past that, which we are in danger of already in the next five to 10 years, then it will be in a huge change in the way we have seen the world. There's a possibility that you will see a huge loss of ice in the polar ice caps melting. You will see, see a perceptible rise of the sea level. And more than that, if you get mega droughts, which we are beginning to see combined with also floods, you're going to see huge damage to particularly the poorer countries. So that's an anomaly in this particular case that the rich countries, which today are mostly in the temperate regions, they will feel the impact of global change, climate change, much less than the poorer countries who are really in the uh, temp basically in the tropics and in the equatorial region. So there is also this climate inequality that countries will not face the damage of all of this equally. Those who are least able to bear the damage will go to are going to face most of the damage. This is the inequality that exists already. The question again is, of course, in the history of climate change, that those who are responsible for the current greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, they are the ones who are going to suffer less. Those who are who have contributed the least amount of greenhouse gases are going to suffer the most. This is the inequity in the system itself. Unfortunately, we can't do much about it except say, okay, now you need to compensate us. You need to do things by which you can control your emissions. And to that, the demand has been from the rich countries, particularly the United States, that the climate change started with common but differentiated responsibility, which means those who have emitted the most should have the major share at least of the financial burden and also the concept of equity which means that you have a right to what would be called the carbon space which is a really a right to energy that if you've already taken up more than your just share then you shouldn't really be emitting more carbon in the to the atmosphere both these things are now right now in COP20, after COP27, seems to be very much weakened. Because if you see, the United States says it doesn't understand common but differentiated responsibility. You see that essentially what the European Union and other countries are arguing when they argue that we should have a blanket ban on fossil, they're saying ban coal. But fossil gas is a, what is called, a, they're saying a transitional fuel. So it's not a fossil fuel by just changing the name, though gas is very much a fossil fuel as much as coal is, you pretend as if 
it is greener than it actually is. And of course, it's true that methane, the uh, gas, which is really what is there in your uh, uh, natural gas, that has, when you, when you burn it, you combust it, it has produces less carbon dioxide than the equal amount of energy from coal produces. But the problem with methane is it's a much more potent greenhouse gas. And what we find from previous uh, literature, from literature that is now appearing, that actually methane leaks are such that whatever gains the uh, natural gas would have given has been already wiped out because of the leaks that are taking place from the natural, uh, natural gas infrastructure to the extent that it seems to be three to four times more or even six times more methane is actually leaking. So given all of this, that if we are really talking about maintaining the 1.5 degree centigrade, it seems really a, or appears to be a lost cause because there is no seriousness of the rich countries to address the issue. And they're seeing how to put the burden of climate change more on the developing countries and of course, on the process are the big emitters, China and India, because they have large population. So if you have one fifth of the population, you automatically are not as big an emitter as China or India by definition, because you don't have that many people. So India, though per capita emission is one fifth, one sixth that of the United States, for example, still is pointed out by others as a big emitter. So essentially, these are the inequities that have come up in COP27. And unfortunately, the commitment, the only positive element that came in COP27 was a loss and damage fund, which they have said, yes, that that is something we should really uh, build. But again, who is going to put how much into that fund has been left open? Right, Prabir. So in this context, since you did mention the loss and damage fund, let's go into that. It's been a demand of developing countries for decades now, almost three decades. Uh, this year, so Pakistan raised it very strongly because it was so affected badly by uh, the floods that took place a few months ago. And uh, there was a sense of celebration when I believe the European Union, which was resisting for the longest time, finally gave in. And there was a basic agreement on that. But many have also pointed out that there is a fund, but like you said, there's no money in it. So considering what has happened in the past over money, would you explain some of the, you know, devils in the details on this uh, loss and damage fund? Well, let's look at what the other fund did or didn't do. There's a hundred billion fund, which was supposed to be contributed by the rich countries by 2020. Now it has reached about what they say, according to OECD report, $83 billion. But the Oxfam uh, take down of that essentially says that it is just, uh, what shall we say, greenwashing, existing loans and other investments, claiming it's uh, really a part of the, the green fund, shall we call it. So this is, uh, and the, the actual amount is only about $23.5 billion, even if you look at it optimistically. So this is the problem that these are not being defined that what exactly are we talking about. So something which was given as a loan is also being shown as, as if it's an aid. So loan and aid are two different things. Even if you give a low interest loan, you can claim that I've done something. But if you give loan at normal interest, that's business as usual. So then it cannot go to your green fund account so the fear is that even if money comes in, if you remember in 2013, the commitment by 2020 has still not been met for the other $100 billion fund. So if this fund is assuming good faith, money comes in, will it come in from the existing commitments already being made? Will it come from investments by private capital, which according to the United States should be counted as a part of this fund? Should it be already existing fund, which will be, which is coming into the other hundred billion dollar? Will it be also shown against this? These are the questions, as you have said, the devil is in the detail. These details as yet are to be worked out. But you know, the, all, all of it boils down to good faith. That are you taking responsibility for the damage you have created? And are you willing to shell out money? The least you can do because you cannot take out carbon from the atmosphere. So are you willing to shell out money, at least to help those who have already 
lost whatever possibility they had of what would be called carbon space. They're not going to get it, particularly large countries in Africa, uh, large part of Africa, and even countries like India. We're not going to get what would be called our due share of carbon space. But are we willing to at least the poorer countries leave out India out of this because they will say, well, you're a big country. But leaving out India, are you willing to be on, on good faith, willing to take or address the problem, which is that they need money in order to transit from a low cost energy path, which is really carbon or natural gas, to basically uh, looking at sun and wind. And also, how do you also address the question of night versus day? Because you need a large storage. How do you address the question of storage? And though that's a bigger question, but the point again is the amount of money involved to reach your 1.5 or 2 degree centigrade target even will cost us trillions of dollars in terms of green investment, green energy investments. That money, the West is not willing to shell out. The rich countries are not willing to shell out. They say, well, you know, we'll give a little bit of our share, but that would be essentially loans. This is what we seem to see, very little in aid. And so I think we are going to see a repeat of what we saw with the earlier green fund, also in the loss and damage fund. Right, Prabir. So uh, in this context, I mean, just addressing a question many people may have. Uh, the question is quite, it goes like this. That, I mean, we are all commonly facing uh, the danger of climate change. You mentioned what could be some of the, uh, you know, the kind of impact that we're facing. Uh, and it happens, like you said, of course, although there is some inequity in the impact, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it also affects all of us in some ways or the other. So uh, many have said that, you know, everyone should work together to sort of uh, try to address this issue. Everyone should try to convert, uh, you know, try to reduce their consumption as much as possible. It has to be our common, uh, say, responsibility in that sense, which is what you alluded to. So what is the problem with this argument, which is something developing countries have been resisting for a long time? In fact, there's two kinds of questions in it. And I think the second one is also very important, that a lot of energy companies will say, you as an individual should reduce your carbon footprint. So essentially, the individual is responsible, not companies, not society at large, not the governments, but each of us. Now, it doesn't work because I, as an individual, cannot change the source of my energy. Is it coming from sunlight? Is it coming from wind? Is it coming from hydroelectricity? Or it's coming from coal or natural gas? And each has a different kind of uh, greenhouse effect. So if you want to look at the source of energy, individuals don't change it. Societies do, which means ultimately the state, the government does. So that is one red herring, which is quite often put that each of us are personally responsible for our carbon footprint, and that's it. So I think that's one thing that we need to put to bed. The second thing is, what does concept of equity mean in climate change? You know, the issue is that we cannot say that the carbon space should belong to whoever comes first, emits, and takes up the carbon space. This is the argument that, the, what the, I will say, the Wild West argument. The land is available. The, there are so-called Red Indians, the indigenous people staying here, but it's really not their land. It's open land and I can take it over, and the government gives me the right to fence in the land. So this principle, if you carry over to climate change argument, is there is carbon space. I came first, okay? I started emitting. I didn't know at that time that climate change could be caused, so I emitted a lot of carbon dioxide. Now you can't come and tell me, you know, I'm responsible. This argument would hold good if you take the pre-1970 year at least into, into account, when we didn't really know how much impact our carbon dioxide could cause. But by 1970s, this was already, scientists were talking about it, and we now have reports of the oil companies who had done detailed research to show what the impact of climate change is going to be. And for the next 30 years, 
they fought a bitter battle to say, no, climate change is not because of carbon dioxide. There is no global warming. All this is BS. Now, this kind of obfuscation was done with the full knowledge of the United States government or the other rich countries' governments that, yes, there is global warming and it is real. So question is, at least from 70, we have a possibility of counting how much carbon dioxide has been emitted. And the reality is most of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is actually post-1970, even our advanced or rich countries. <coughs> So if you take that into account, and you can say 1950, 1960, 1970, whatever you want to take, even by all that account, you will find the rich countries, the United States and Western Europe, has the largest share of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now the question is that if we want to keep 1.5 degrees, the amount of carbon space left in this language is roughly about what we would blow past, as I said, in the next 10 years, if we continue to emit at the same rate, probably in the next five to six years, we have to drastically cut our emissions, which is what the government of India, in fact, in, in the COP27, said all fossil fuels then should be cut, to which there is a huge opposition because the European Union and the United States, but more the European Union, said gas is okay. It produces carbon dioxide at the end, but you know less. Therefore, we can't say all fossil fuels. And the European Union has been trying to move, a, in fact, a, a position that gas is a transitional fuel, not a greenhouse fuel. Not a, it, it should not be called a you know, fossil fuel. But be that as it may, the basic task is equity is not going to be there because already these countries have grabbed carbon space. And because they burn already so much fuel, including natural gas and coal, that they, in fact, the Ukraine war made it even worse, they are not willing to cut down their consumption. And the problem is there is no easy way to provide energy when the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine. So that's still a bigger, big problem that lies. But yes, that can be solved with investment. That's an investment they're not willing to make. They want to postpone it as far as possible. So the issue of trying to use up energy comes in most sharply when they tell the African Union countries, African countries, we want your gas. We want your oil. We will use it, but you can't use it because global warming. So this is what somebody has, I think, captured, you know, uh, gas and oil for we, but not for we. So these are the kind of equity issues that are coming in. And I think the COP27 this, this way, this time has been a step back because the, the, you can see clearly the equity issues and common but differentiated responsibility is disappearing from the language of the COP. COP. And even the Paris Agreement, which was there, is today being lost sight of. And what the wealthy countries, the rich countries are saying, we should take only the baseline as Glasgow, where these things already have been weakened. So not referring to the original means, forget about common but differentiated responsibility, who has to do how much, and equity, who gets how much. Those two things should be forgotten. So I think that's the, shall we say, the negative part of the COP27, can the poorer countries bring this back to the table and say, yes, this has to be done, but you have a bulk of the responsibility because you've occupied that space. So yes, we will not continue on the path which you are doing at the moment. We are going at the moment, but at the same time, money has to be made available just because we have many times the population of the United States. Therefore, our responsibility is the same as the United States who emits five times per capita, six times per capita greenhouse gas as an Indian does. And at the end of it, you need energy. It's not that you emit carbon because you want to, because you need energy. So it's a less expensive, more expensive energy we are talking about. And irrespective of what the people may say, renewable energy, the major problem is how to store renewable energy. 
And if you take that cost into account, it's a considerable cost. Scrapping your existing energy producing infrastructure at the moment is not viable, at least for the poorer countries. And that, these, I think, are the issues which are going to haunt the future cops. Thank you so much, Prabir. We're quite a grim picture, especially because, like we come back to again and again in each of these shows, uh, the <clears throat> our past, you know, our past does cast a shadow on us. The uh, imperialism plays out in various forms today, even in seemingly uh, technical aspects such as climate change. We'll be following many similar issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching Newsclip.